Today on the Unveiled podcast, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Stephen Kessler. Stephen has been a psychotherapist in the San Francisco Bay Area for almost 30 years, teaching both locally and internationally. He is a certified EFT, emotional freedom technique expert and trainer, and is the best-selling author of The Five Personality Patterns, a simple, clear, true-to-life map of personality that gives you the key to understanding people and communicating with them effectively. This is a fascinating conversation where Stephen and I talk about the personality patterns but we also talk about energy medicine and we talk about what happens and forms during early relationships to develop these personality patterns in the first place. We also talk about the narrowing of perception and attention that happens when we have these personality patterns at play and how it literally colors and shapes the way we experience and both live within and enjoy our reality. Stephen shares with me on this podcast what he believes is the key to a regulated, healthy, happy life. And I'm not gonna spoil it, but it is an incredibly powerful statement that really resonated with me as he shared it. I really hope that you enjoy this podcast, you hear reference in this podcast to my new job. I have taken over as the COO and lead clinician at Kuya. Kuya is a transformational healing center and community space based in Austin, Texas. And if you are local to Kuya, I encourage you to come down. If you would like to learn more about Kuya, you can head to the website at kuya.life. And you are more than welcome to stay tuned to the Unveil podcast as we will have some very exciting announcements coming very soon about how Unveil is going to be changing and transforming alongside Kuya going forwards. But for now, please enjoy this wide ranging and incredibly insightful conversation with Stephen Kessler. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to the Unveil podcast, Stephen Kessler. Thank you for being with me today. I am really excited about this conversation because your name will be recognizable to some of the people I know listening to this. I've told a few people that you were you had the well you gave me the honor of giving me this interview and um, they were really excited (laughs) so so your name precedes you but for all of those who are like who is this person what does he do I'd really love for you to give our listeners just that little taster of who you are and how you serve what is it you do for the world um well I've been a a licensed psychotherapist for 40 years Mm. So that's the the big sort of easy piece. Mm -hmm. Before I uh, shifted into psychotherapy, I was an actor. My bachelor's degree is in acting. It was mostly stage. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the through line has been like sort of what is going on with people? What is happening here? And, And what is real? I mean, before I went to acting school to be an actor, I um, I attended MIT in Boston, mm-hmm. studied physics, because growing up I realized that our real um, our real religion that tells us what is true and why we're here is science. That's what we really turn to, mm-hmm. and that physics is the kind of priesthood of science. Like they're the ones mm-hmm. who can say what's really going on, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to join the priesthood and find out what's really going on. <laughs> it's a good of motivation as any, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And when yeah. I got there and started asking my physics professors about it, they said, you know, Stephen, you, you can't ask these questions in science. These are theological questions. Interesting. And uh, so I thought, okay, uh, physics can't tell me. Maybe, maybe emotion is more real. Mm. So, I'll, you know, I'll go study emotion by being an actor and besides i was i was pretty tightly wrapped i needed some help to you know recover my emotional life Mm. as a young man Mm -hmm. and i was a well brought up young man on the east coast of the united states so therapy was out of the question i mean that's (laughs) nobody does that nobody would do that (laughs) so um so going to acting school seemed like the the open avenue so that's what i did Mm. so physics acting school therapy um and and more recently studying energy work Mm. which is a wonderful map of all the things it's like we start with 
trying to yeah. understand it and then we try and get mm. into the human sense of it and then then we get into energy work which I'm sure some people think is not connected at all and others would think oh no that's the whole story so that yeah. it's fascinating yeah it seems like people have an energy body mm. which is you know vaguely the same size and shape as your physical body but it underlies the physical body and in some ways creates it and and sustains it feeds it mm. And, you know, Chinese acupuncture is based on that knowledge. I mean, they're yeah. they're working with the flow of energy through the energy channels and the energy body. Mm. And they recognize that if the energy is not flowing well, the body gets sick mm. and the emotions get sick. And I began to discover that that was a lot more efficient as a way to deal with human emotions than traditional talk therapy. Had. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm. So that's so a what, little bit. That's a little bit about what you do. And people will know your name, I suspect, from your five personality patterns right. book and work. And I kind of do want to start there with the sense of let's just unpack that a little bit. Where did that come from? And and right. you know, I, I'd love to dig into what got you there. Like how did you from acting school and all the things get mm -hmm. into this kind of personality patterns? And and what does that mean to you as an as a body of work? Yeah. First thing is that I did not create this map of personality. Mm -hmm. This actually started back in the 1930s uh, with the observations of a therapist in Germany named Wilhelm Reich, who was one of the star students of Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. And Reich was more focused on the body and more sensitive to energy. So he started noticing that there were these these clusters, he referred to them as resistance patterns mm. because in Freudian psychology, everything is about resistance. Resistance, yeah. <laughs> They're in the power. So, you know, you're resisting my power. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but it began with him and I didn't discover it actually until past midlife. Mm. I, um, in my... Um, studies of people and stuff i had uh i'd been studying various maps of personality and the enneagram was the main one that i studied i was a student of that for 20 years and and um thought very highly of it until i began studying um, energy work and working with energy and part of that involved learning uh, about the character structure patterns that was the original, the term for it, character structure, mm. which seems to be a very useful phrase in German. But in English, the word character means being of good character. It yeah. doesn't mean your personality. Yeah. Yeah. So really, it's about personality structure. So interesting when you think of the linguistic difference and just right. the, the cueing of the brain in totally the wrong direction when you're using a word that doesn't translate effectively yeah when when in english when we talk about someone's character we're talking about their moral rectitude yeah. right rather than the the structure of their personality mm -hmm. but anyway i um about almost 20 years ago now i um i began learning about these personality patterns and um using them in my work with my clients and observing them in myself and in my classmates and in my friends and my relatives and everywhere around me and pretty quickly i realized this is a better map than the enneagram far superior to the myers briggs mm -hmm. or anything else that i had seen and as I studied it more and more, and I was learning it from real life, from um, not learning it out of books, but learning it in, from the oral tradition and from actual personal experience. So I was right. getting it in my body. Yeah. One of the main things that I have learned in the latter part of my life is that real knowledge is embodied knowledge. <laughs> Having it only in your head, that's a nice start, but it doesn't really matter. Mm. You have to get it in your body to really have it. And that means personal experience. Mm. 
but as I um, as I began to really get into studying character structure and understand it more deeply and look at, uh, there have been only a few books written about it, you know, mm. a dozen maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I began to realize that there was nothing really very easy to read or very clear about mm -hmm. it. Mm. Um, uh, you know, Reich is impenetrable. It's translated from German. Uh, his student, Alexander Lowen, uh, you know, good, but still like really up in his head and fellow student, yeah. John Pericos, yeah. uh, more into energy. Yeah. And then we have Barbara Brennan, yes. who is a hands-on healer mm -hmm. and uh, dead now, but apparently enormously talented. Mm -hmm. Big school, still going all over the world. But in reading her descriptions of this, it became apparent to me that unless you see auras, it's very hard to understand what she's saying. <laughs> yes, yes. And I don't see auras. So I thought, you know, we got to make this accessible to the average person. Sure. So basically what I did was pull together all the uh, writings and teachings about it that I could lay my hands on mm. and try to integrate those and make it clear. Mm. And um, apparently I did a fairly good job because one of the things people say about the book is, wow, this is really clear. I really understand. Yeah. I said that to you in our first conversation when we sort of chatted about having this recording and I did it in, in retrograde. So I kind of found, well, it's actually interesting that you mentioned Barbara Brennan because she, I, I started with understanding and looking into her work a long, long time ago. We're talking when I was very, very young, um, which I did not know was kind of connected here. Like you can, this is the thing, you can study some of these things. too. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a for NASA for you really are the priests I mean it's a thing <laughs> but it, and it's 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 fascinating because what I um what I love about people like yourself is I think that teaching these first principles energetic side of things is really valuable mm -hmm. but I don't think you can do it from the complexity level because you may speak to somebody but you're not speaking to everybody and the thing about your right. work is it's so um concise about what it's saying right. and also isn't reductionist it gives the element of um healing cues and things like that within the personality patterns to understand that one this isn't a fixed state it's not like uh, right. it happened and you're the done it's something you do it is not who you are who you it's are a defense strategy a safety strategy yeah. which is is and I'm going to come back to that because I this is so um, relevant and juicy and really important for people to grasp and understand in terms of uh, patterns and habits and the fact that this isn't character. It isn't like an innate um, beingness. Uh, it's it's a learned behavior essentially. Um, but I and I what I didn't realize about the energy stuff. Now you've mentioned it, it's kind of obvious to me. Um, and, and my Unveil Academy students will know that I have included teaching about personality patterns in one of the modules. They're actually going to study it the day that this is released because I'm going to release this very soon after we've recorded it. There is a reason. Um, but <laughs> what I love and what I was doing was finding was the pictures that you have. And I hadn't seen them when I originally learned the personality patterns. And then I read your book because somebody told me the verbiage and it kind of made sense and it landed. But the pictures of movement and energy attachments and all the things I was like this is this is making a lot of sense and that speaks to energy models as well which is all all fascinating yeah yeah, yeah. And, and so yes do feel free to I was just gonna I really would love you to just explain from your lens of understanding how these personality patterns are established you know what is the thing that leads to the establishment yeah. of patterns like this I don't think any of us know for sure mm. how much a child adopts a given set of personality patterns. And it's a set. There's usually two, sometimes three. We don't know how, how much of their adoption of whatever patterns they develop is inborn, like they were born with this proclivity or this you know, mm -hmm. this sort of decision maybe mm -hmm. before coming into this life, mm -hmm. I'm going to develop these patterns because I need them to accomplish my purpose in this life versus how much arises from 
uh, the child's environment. Mm -hmm. What we do know for certain is that every kid has problems, mm -hmm. right? Every day. <laughs> And the problem might be as simple as, you know, I want the cookie and mom won't give it to me. Mm -hmm. Or it might be I have a, an older brother or sister who's like bigger and stronger and they beat up on me. Or um, it, it might be um, uh, mom and dad are very, um, say, caught in the rigid pattern and they're very into the rules and doing things correctly. And they're not focused on their heart center, but I have a very strong heart center and I need some connection to the heart center. Mm. So I'm, I'm trying to learn their rules, but I don't really care about that stuff. Really, mm. it's right. Mm -hmm. so there are a whole lot of factors, mm. but the one thing that I think we can say um, with a lot of certainty is that, first of all, each of these personality patterns develops out of a particular safety strategy, mm. a thing the kid does to try to feel safer, mm. leaving, connecting, hunkering down and hiding, trying to get big and intimidating and dominate or, you know, perform well, be good, obey the rules. Those five safety strategies, five, um, actually, <laughs> Each one develops into one of those patterns. Yeah. And every kid tries out all five of them. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, that's interesting. Yes. And you can watch a little kid do this. Right. But the kid learns very quickly through experience mm -hmm. that certain safety strategies work better for them in their yes. situation than other ones. Yeah. And then they do the logical and rational thing. Mm -hmm. They repeat the ones that work better and they drop yeah. the ones that don't work so well. Mm -hmm. And it's through constant repetition, constantly using, you know, one safety strategy and their other safety strategy over and over and over again, that they develop their set of personality patterns. Mm -hmm. The patterns do get conditioned into a person's body. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they are... Um, they're built into a person's structure, which means that it, it, there's a there's an unconscious automatic movement to do that whenever you're in distress. Hmm. Because remember, these are safety strategies, right? You If you already feel safe, you don't need a safety strategy. Mm -hmm. But if something's happening and you're feeling scared and upset and overwhelmed, now you go to a safety strategy. Mm -hmm. Try to feel safer. Mm -hmm. um, so as a as a kid develops their favorite safety strategies and develops the personality patterns that grow out of those mm -hmm. you know, probably two stra safety strategies, mm -hmm. um, they they develop a kind of a self-reinforcing uh, circle for mm -hmm. each of the patterns mm -hmm. in other words each of the patterns becomes self-reinforcing mm -hmm. thing you do to feel safer actually limits what you pay attention to and makes the world look a certain way and that causes you to want to do that thing some more mm -hmm. and you form beliefs mm -hmm. that's that's kind of heady Probably a, an example would be better, right? I I really love Hedy, but you can absolutely give an example. And then I want to go back and double click on a couple right. of things. But yeah, to give an example. Suppose that um, you frequently feel scared and helpless and um, like you have no power. And the, the only thing you can do, and this, I mean, consider if you're in the womb, if you're one year old, you can't run away. You sure. can't fight back. Mm -hmm. very few options mm -hmm. you know you can you can reach out for help you can cry and hope someone will come or you can leave your body mm -hmm. leaving safety strategy is available even to a fetus in the womb mm -hmm. and if you uh, frequently feel overwhelmed and as a result leave and remember 
all of these safety strategies are employed when a person feels overwhelmed to try to reduce their overwhelm and feel safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So say you're a little kid, you, maybe you've got a parent who gets mad and threatens you, or you've got an older brother or sister or two or three of them mm -hmm. who, you know, hit you, threaten to hit you, scare you, whatever. For some reason, the world seems really scary. So you leave a lot. That causes certain things to happen. One is your attention. When your energy leaves your body, your attention goes too. Mm -hmm. When your attention goes anywhere, your energy, your life energy follows it. That means your life energy is not in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's out there somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Your body is not getting as much life energy as it needs. Mm. Your body doesn't get strong and muscular. Your body remains kind of thin and wiry and <laughs> disjointed, and you're not good at physically fighting. Yeah. Right? And the whole world seems dangerous to you. Mm -hmm. So you develop a belief that uh, the world is dangerous and you need to look out for the danger. So your consciousness attunes to any signs of danger mm -hmm. Notice you're not attuned to power you're not attuned to correctness uh, obeying the rules you're not attuned to love and connection mm -hmm. you're attuned to danger yeah. oncoming threat mm -hmm. how do i get out of the way how do i disappear how do i not be here mm -hmm. right so you begin to see danger everywhere because that's what your sensors are looking for right yeah and that of course makes the world seem more dangerous mm -hmm. mm. and you that reinforces your belief that the world is dangerous and mm -hmm. that you need to be ready to leave and you always keep the back door open you know physically emotionally yeah. energetically yeah so you develop the leaving pattern mm. That, that would be one example of how a, a, a simple solution in childhood yeah. that you adopt and repeat mm. develops into a whole set of beliefs about life, right. your place in life, your capacities, mm. your, um, your remedies yeah. when mm. you're unhappy. Mm -hmm. mm. And I... I love that you gave us all of that detail because what my brain does when people tell me things like this is I tie all the things together. And so you, the, there's a, a lot of um, kind of the original somatic education in what you've just been yeah. describing, that forming around the insult or, or whatever, that, yeah. that kind of like the organization of the system in mm -hmm. such a way that shifts the flow of energy essentially it shifts attention it shifts the movement pattern and some of the work we do from the somatic lens would be to disorganize that pattern in terms of what is the thing that is the how do you know you're about to do the thing is one of the big questions that perhaps Kellerman right. would ask right. and so it's interesting when you like look at this from kind of the personality patterns end of things where it's like and I what I love about the way you describe this, what you describe it in the book and you described it just here today with me, this isn't a trauma response and trauma can be fetishized at the moment in kind of social media. It's not, yeah. it's not something really terrible happened and you did this thing. It's like, it just can be the minor things. It's how your young nervous system organizes around the ability to attach to and receive the things that you needed, essentially. Yeah, how your young nervous system a conscious awareness, your spirit, if you will, yeah. um, finds strategies to try to feel safer. Yeah, it's like the classic self-soothing, but not with like sucking your thumb or whatever. It's actually like, how do I regulate the overwhelm? How do I en enable I myself to feel safe in a situation which isn't, which doesn't feel safe? And leaving your body does yeah. help you feel safer because you now totally. don't feel your body's distress so much right and one of the side effects is you don't really want to come back because when you come back the distress is still there mm -hmm. you know it's yeah. sort of like if your house caught fire and you ran out to get away from the fire mm -hmm. 
you don't want to go back because your house is still on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And no, a sensible back. decision. And I love that example because it's a sensible decision. Why would you walk back into a house that's still on fire? You wouldn't do that. So right. it's like, right. it's just, it's intelligence from the vehicle itself that is, you know, the yeah. leaving pattern. And it's funny because I live in Austin, Texas, and this is kind of like everyone's on a mushroom trip or a psychedelic thing every weekend <laughs> or whatever. And I'm like, you guys, you're just literally trying to leave the body to not be with the experience that you're currently living. There's this kind of, I, I would rather be out of this because this isn't comfortable. And I think we can go down the rabbit hole of whatever the, this isn't comfortable comes from. And I, obviously there is trauma in there and there is just sometimes an inability to be with reality. But th there's so many things these days which can facilitate the leaving, whether it's a Netflix binge or alcohol or right. the psychedelic world, which is purported to be therapeutic and healing and sitting in a center which delivers ketamine therapy. But like the way we do it mm -hmm. is not so that people can just get out. Like with the, the out is right. not the thing right. in and here is the thing. If the drug helps you um, shift your perspective on the trauma, understand it more deeply, heal something about it, mm -hmm. discover, oh, wait a minute, I wasn't that person I thought I was, I was, right. different, and I have a lot more options here, mm -hmm. then you're different after the, the drug trip, yeah. right, and you can live differently in your life, if the drug trip is just a vacation, you go away and then you come back. You come back right to the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Then, then you didn't accomplish much. It's yeah. that's a lot like, you know, um, alcohol or cigarettes or any other process that um, dulls your awareness. Yeah. Oh, veils. I love the way you just threw the the podcast title in there. Um, <laughs> And I love that you said that because what I'm seeing at the moment is this polarization between, you know, psychedelic pro psychedelics and psychedelic bashing. And I'm like, no, no, there's a, it's a tool. Like anything is a tool, right. like having right. an awareness of the personality patterns doesn't do anything on its own. It's a tool. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to fix you because you've read your book. Um, it's an app that will show you something about what the whole human possibilities are and where you are stuck. Yes. But the idea is you're caught in a certain set of prisons, invisible yeah. prisons, that are yeah. running your life and you don't realize you're caught in prison. Yes. And your job is to get out of pattern. Yeah. At least momentarily. Yes. Right? Yeah. To get out of those prisons and be present instead. Mm-hmm. And that begins with awareness. It begins with knowing that there's even a pattern game that you're playing. And I think that's why I love that your book is so easy to understand because you don't need to have any qualifications in any kind of anything to read your book or to listen to your audio book or, or all the things. Um, because there's just this element of recognizability. And that's what I love about people who really distill this kind of system mm -hmm. or maps in a really easy way. I like reading things where people can go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and they can see themselves in the thing and then they know what they're doing. They know that they know at which point they are in the map and therefore potentially how to move beyond where they are. Yeah. Lots of uh, professions use jargon as shorthand to talk to each other. Yeah. For them, it actually facilitates the communication. Mm -hmm. But when talking to ordinary people who don't understand the jargon, it becomes, um, a barrier to understanding. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you have to unjargon something and make it understandable to the average person or they don't get it. <laughs> it's yeah. why you, I'm, I'm surprised you haven't been in the meetings I've been having all day because we've been having these conversations. It's like, how do you say what you mean without either using a word that's been changed in its meaning somehow in the modern right. use of the word right. and also without just using buzzwords that mean nothing? <laughs> it's like it's a, it's a complicated right. world that we live in. You have again, this comes back to embodiment. Yeah. If you have personally experienced it, you can speak from your own experience. Yeah. That's exactly the conclusion we came to today. You sure you weren't in that meeting? I've just finished because <laughs> and we got to this. And you know, when what, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, whether it's branding or just speaking truth to something, or you know, I was talking about my academy to my students and to my colleagues. And it's like that's the culmination of a two plus decade journey of 
knowing something. So it's here. It's not kind of, oh, it's up here. It's like it's in me. And therefore it comes out. And I think that awareness is the first point of all of these journeys. And I really love the people who bring awareness to something that could so, because the personality patterns start so young and they become so part of you in fact over time they essentially do become what you think of as your character in a way so you know there's that original german back in people become very identified with their personality patterns and you will hear it in the way they talk about themselves right well why do you act that way why do you do that thing they'll say oh that's just the way i am yeah it's just me me right yeah which is a statement you know, it's in ordinary language, but basically they're saying, oh, I'm so identified with this with unconscious the- part of myself. Yeah. I think it is myself. And I'm not aware that there's actually a more true part of myself, a true self that is more present. That's so juicy. It's not and, a modern pattern. Yeah. And that's and- where we all start because we are, are all initially caught mm-hmm. in the the trance sort of mm-hmm. or the the prison cells of our personality patterns and of our mm-hmm. infrastructure in general yeah and it's i love how you brought in it changes how you see the world because i think what we don't realize is that the the, the this is why my company's called unveil it's like the veils that you see through will yeah. absolutely change your reality. They won't just change the way you feel about it or the way you see it. They will literally change the, what's possible for you in a trajectory because you're only open to the thing that's possible. And they will change how you see the world. Yeah. You know, the, the, the simple analogy that everyone knows is um, seeing the world in black and white. We've all seen black and white movies, black and white photographs, maybe black and white TV if you're old enough. <laughs> um, and we've all seen the world in color. Mm. So we can we can recognize that. If you have only seen the world in black and white, mm. and you don't even know there is color in the world, mm. when you get out of the, the prison of black and white, mm-hmm. and you start to see colors, it is a, literally a whole new world. Yeah. And we can relate that actually to the personality patterns because the rigid pattern, while it doesn't control seeing color, Mm -hmm. it does make you view the world sort of in black and white in the sense of right and wrong, correct and incorrect, Mm -hmm. good and bad. And if you are only seeing the world in terms of right and wrong, Literally, that's the only world you're seeing. Right. And then if somebody points out to you, you know, you're really kind of stuck in seeing this whole right and wrong. What about the other parts? Mm. Oh, the, a person will go, well, what other parts? <laughs> right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. And so when you kind of move through into decodifying some of this and making it accessible, are you were you kind of seeing it everywhere and started to use the kind of model or the thinking around it in clinical practice or were you what was the kind of trajectory from there? Yes, I had been using it for ten years in my own clinical practice. Mm. Um, I had been discovering how useful it it was for mm. uh, helping clients understand themselves and how yeah. they were caught in their own habits of attention. Mm. Because fundamentally, each of these personality patterns is, at the at the, the most basic sense, it is a habit of attention. Mm. Our attention is habituated to sort of looking only in a certain way, looking through a certain lens, yeah. looking at a certain part of reality, and ignoring the rest of it. Yeah. So mm. these habits of attention are really an important part of it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and when you when you were kind of go ahead moved, sorry carry on yeah oh no I was going to say I just I forgot where I was going with the rest of that so no it's it's good I was just asking about using it in clinical practice I, I, when I I'm really interested in how foundational you are seeming to be to me to be saying this is there is this sense of this completely 
was going to say skews, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but it, it, it contracts your visual field, your perception, your awareness. So it is, it has to be so foundational to so many of the things that someone would show up in therapy for almost like real core stuff here. Yes. Uh, there's a technical explanation for how that perceptual change happens. Yeah, I'd love it. So the, the neuropsychologists um, teaming up with uh, computer experts Mm -hmm. have measured how fast the conscious mind can compute and how fast the unconscious mind can compute. Yeah. And as I recall the numbers, um, I think it was 40 bits of data per second for the conscious mind uh -huh. and 40 million bits of data <sighs> per second for the unconscious mind. Oh my God, I've not heard that fact before. That's insane. Right. So you're, and by unconscious mind, we mean your entire physical body and all of its nervous systems as well. It's everything that's operating below your conscious awareness. Yeah. So that's your blood pressure, your heart rate, your blood salinity, your blood pH, your digestive yeah. processes, yeah. your metabolic processes, mm -hmm. your circulation through your body, Mm -hmm. uh, your the physical location of your body parts in space, the the you know movement, balance, posture, thousands of things, mm -hmm. and all this data that it's coming in uh, outside your awareness that mm -hmm. we then refer to as intuition or a sixth sense or I just had a feeling or right. like that. And then you get to the problem of, okay, you've got this million to one difference in mm. processing power. Mm. So then when your unconscious mind, when your body, unconscious mind, and I use them almost sort of interchangeably, mm -hmm. when that part of you perceives something, it has to somehow decide, is this important enough to pass upstairs to the conscious mind? Mm. or not but i can only pass a tiny little sliver <laughs> one one million oh, of all right. data so what is going to appear in your conscious mind if you think of the computer analogy what shows up on your computer screen yeah the visual the auditory yeah the aesthetic the, the stuff you're aware of that's only one one millionth of what your body is processing. Mm -hmm. But which one millionth is it? Yeah. It's the sliver that your unconscious beliefs say is important and you should always pay attention to. Got it. Yeah. So if you have an unconscious belief mm -hmm. that the world is dangerous and you need to get away from danger, then danger is what's important. And all danger will be displayed for you to see, mm. which helps you stay away from the danger. But it also makes you think that's all there is. Mm. That would tend to lead you into or that would be a development of the leaving pattern. Right sure. now, if you are more um, if you've developed the merging pattern and that's the dominant pattern in your body mm. at the moment, that pattern is not looking for danger. Mm. That pattern is looking for love, for connection. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So you're not seeing the danger. You're seeing connection. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking, are they dangerous? You're thinking, do they like me? Hmm. Do I like them? Oh, of course I like them. Do they mm -hmm. like me? I'll bet mm -hmm. they would. I should meet them. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You are seeing a fundamentally different picture of the world. Now, yeah. it's same world out there but your unconscious mind to conscious mind transfer is of a different slice of the whole reality mm -hmm. and since it's the only slice you see all the time mm -hmm. you think it's the whole picture mm -hmm. uh, one way people can understand this easily is thinking of tv channels mm -hmm. we all have the experience of watching different channels on tv and that certain channels have different stuff. Like there's a there's a channel for horror movies, mm. right? 
Mm -hmm. I don't know which one it is that I don't like horrible. No, I don't want to know. I was just thinking what? that <laughs> yeah, it exists. If you, if you turn to that channel any time of the night or day, it's a horror movie play, mm. right? That's all you see on that channel. Mm. There's another channel, the, the Hallmark channel, for instance. Yes. It's all about relationship and good relationships. Maybe there's some trouble and because that creates a little tension and a little trouble. But by the end of the movie, everybody's happy again. Yeah, this is my no. kind of channel. <laughs> it's going to be a happy ending, right? Yes. Two different channels, and they're showing different aspects of the real world. Yeah. Both aspects are part of the real world. Yeah. But each channel shows only that particular slice. Mm. And if that's the only slice you ever see... You think that's the real world, the real world. and the whole world, mm. and it completely colors everything at that point. It's it's yeah. it changes everything, and it's it's it seems to me that then the resolution of some of this is bringing attention and awareness and drawing perception of either broader, um, more television channels to use the analogy. And also uh, to use a phrase that I hear a lot um, as well in like trauma resolution world, it's like coming into contact with reality. It's like the reality right. is not the narrow one channel. The reality is that your television is able to access all the channels and you should be have a, a television remote so you can change them. It's kind of right. that. And, and what the remote does for you is give you the ability to voluntarily change the part of the world you're seeing. Mm hmm. And you begin to discover, oh, this is only one slice, and that's only another slice, and that's another slice. Yeah. When we talk about being present rather than caught in a pattern, right? by present, we mean actually with your awareness in the here and now, yeah. not caught in some trauma from the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the here and now, grounded, centered, open available to perceive what's actually here and now yeah yeah and right. able to change the remote that and the ability to see and to know which channel is on which number right. and tune in when we need to right. and and, and fil effectively filter um in a different way i guess yeah well and as people um begin to learn this map of the personality patterns and discover which patterns they automatically go into and tend to live inside and begin to understand, begin to perceive when they are caught in one of their patterns mm -hmm. and then start to learn how to get uncaught, how to, how to get themselves out of that particular pattern. Mm. And, you know, it's like changing the channel back to being present. Mm. The problem is, even after you come back to being present, your body tends to automatically go back. Uh, yeah. To yeah. Where you use, you're used to being. Right. Your attention is habituated. Yes. Old habit is strong and it takes your attention back there. And mm. that's why you have to practice over and over mm -hmm. coming back to presence. Mm. And that's what all meditation practices are about. Mm-hmm. All attentional practices are intended to help you gain voluntary yeah. control over your attention, mm -hmm. which before, you know, when you haven't done any attention practice, your attention just flits around right. from one place to another. It goes to the shiny object, the loud noise, the sudden movement, anything, right? Someone mm -hmm. changes their keys and boy, you're there. Mm. Um, mm. This. It's like, you know, the joke about a, a dog, you know, a squirrel. <laughs> yes, yes. We're like and, that. Right, and you can actually be on the phone with people and they're like, <laughs> like on Zoom now, you, you're actually capturing this in real time where people just get so distracted. All, all meditation practices and a lot of other practices like learning to play the piano, yeah. learning to pole vault, learning to play tennis, learning chess learning to do mathematics, learning any skill mm -hmm. is an attentional practice on a more fundamental level yeah. because you are practicing 
holding your attention on this thing that we're paying attention to right now. Yeah. And when it goes off somewhere else, bringing it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever done, you know, sitting meditation, retreats, <laughs> you find out, oh my God. Yeah. You suddenly <laughs> witness the chaos that exists in your own conscious mind. Yeah. And you're like, uh. <laughs> Hold my attention for four and a half seconds. And right. then Oh, man. Wow, you made it to four and a half. I'm more like one and three quarters. And then I'm like, <laughs> but there is this, um, I love that um, it's this like your idea of the subconscious mind being like the body as well. It's like that innate intelligence that gets yes. it right, but it can skew everything. Is that the bit that kind of got you into energy work or am I making links there that don't exist with the energy work before? Like, how do we get to energy work? Because you, you led with that and I can't leave that undiscussed. So um, I came into energy work through a couple of different channels. Mm -hmm. One is that um, when I was born, there was something wrong with my feet and the way the bones were. They were kind of like frozen together in my feet. Yeah. And I had little, my mom called them cookies. They're little wedges that would go inside my little baby shoes. Yeah. And my mom, bless her heart, kept all those medical records. <laughs> which proved to be very useful to me when I turned 18 during the Vietnam War. Mm. And the draft in this country was, you know, done by lottery. And they were taking the first hundred numbers, right? And my number was um, 18. And I was able to um, submit all that medical stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and get uh, evaluations from medical doctors in the present moment, mm -hmm. which did two things. It explained to me why my feet always hurt. <laughs> right. Like anytime I put on any kind of boots, like ski boots, ski wow. boots agony. Yeah. And it demonstrated to the military that combat boots would also be agony and this would not work out well. So <laughs> right. I didn't have to go to Vietnam, thank God. Wow, yeah. And the second thing it did was it then set me on a path of trying to find some doctor somewhere who could fix this for me. Got it. And yeah. I visited a lot of surgeons and a mm -hmm. lot of um, um, podiatrists mm -hmm. and a lot of body workers. Yeah. I must have gone through a dozen at least different body workers. Right. Until I found one here in Berkeley who was just extraordinary mm. and was able to gradually loosen up the little bones in my feet. And for the first time in my life, when I put my foot down on the ground, I could feel the ground under my feet. Wow. There's a, a literal feeling of support. From I was going to say, there's a lot of energetic themes yeah. under here of not being supported. Yeah had never felt it before and of course I didn't even know I was missing it yeah and after 15 years of body work mm -hmm. uh the body work but my body had gotten much uh in much better shape not just my feet mm. I mean, there were all these things she would do she would do stuff to like crack open my chest the the ways I was tensing to protect my heart she would crack open my chest and I would just burst into tears. Mm. And we did this like every week for years. Yeah. Wow. Until I had basically cried out yeah. most of the terror and trauma and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So as th that body work gradually morphed into working with energy, mm. this very talented body worker would have me lying on the table and she would say, okay, Stephen, now you're only in your body down to about your waist. Come on down into your legs. And I say like, what are you talking about? <laughs> How, like what now? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> right. Just intend to come down into your legs and inhabit your legs. Just imagine that you're doing that. I'd be like, okay, sounds crazy. But I would do it and she would say, okay, that's better. You're down to your knees. Now come on down, ankles, feel your feet. And she was gradually teaching me to be aware of energy. Mm. And after years of that, she began teaching classes for people 
mm. uh, to teach them about awareness of energy and about holding more energy in your body and then using it consciously to, to do useful stuff. Mm. Mm. It's a whole technology and it's magic, according to our science, because mm -hmm. our science doesn't include the energy world. Mm -hmm. So we think of this technology, uh, our society thinks of this technology as like strange, crazy magic stuff. Yeah. But then again, I also visited, um, you know, the the bush in Africa mm -hmm. uh, when I was about 40. And, um, and I took a, uh, a video camera and I could, you know, video people and then play it back for them. And for them, this was like, this is magic. You're stealing my soul. You can't do that. <laughs> right? Because for them, their image was their soul. Oh, wow. For them, our everyday video camera was magic. Yeah. It's a technology they didn't understand. They don't understand. Thank you. I, yeah. And I, I remember this from the first time we actually had our chat, actually. Like, I... This is the fault of expectation on my part. Like I was expecting a kind of like, let's have a clinical chat about personality models and nervous systems and stuff like that. And we ended up having like a, I don't know, 45 minute chat about individuation and evolution of consciousness, which yeah. was awesome. And we are going to segue slightly into that now. But it's this kind of, I love people like you who have so much practical common senseness because you have to to write the book you wrote and get the personality pattern stuff and understand the science and talk about mm, the amount of attention and percentages and stuff but mm -hmm. get that it's the same thing and it's in the same world as these energy disciplines and this technology yeah. and the the felt sense is is now used really often in kind of like somatic world and all the yes. things and on instagram and it's like right and what do people think they're describing? The energy, the how it feels is like the energy stuff. And also yeah. we can work with that. And that's not necessarily something that falls into the lexicon of like insurable, you know, conditions and treatments and all the things. Right. right. And maybe somebody and finds it. Companies are still stuck up in their heads with. Right. And, you know, making money. Yeah. 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 Um, so what do you, what's your kind of, passions right now what are you working on what are you doing why were we talking about individuation and the evolution of consciousness <laughs> like how did we get there i don't remember well, how we got there actually that's been, that's been a um um an interest of mine for i don't know decades yeah in in my early 30s i uh began going to the men's conferences that robert fly and michael mead were holding for men uh-huh um, and one of the things that would happen there is, um, Robert would tell a fairy tale and he would spend the whole week, you know, tell a piece and then another piece and another piece. And we would work with it and we would start to, we'd work with it psychologically and we'd start to open it up and find out, well, where do we find ourselves living in that fairy tale? What is mm. the scene or the character or the situation? Mm -hmm that attracts our attention right and through that mm -hmm. i um i became interested in not just fairy tales but in mythology in general yes. mm -hmm. i actually had been interested in mythology even in high school mm -hmm. you know reading edith hamilton and joseph campbell and stuff like yeah. that yeah yeah and i began to realize that the mythology of each culture is the the whole set of beliefs that it holds about who we are, why we're here, what we're supposed to do, what's our relationship with the divine, what's a good life, all those questions. Mm -hmm. And that in our current um, culture, mm -hmm. we have our own mythology. We don't call it a mythology because yeah. we are inside it and we believe it. Yeah. And we use the word mythology only to refer to other people's beliefs. Yeah. Which we declare to be wrong and untrue. Of course. And then people use the word myth as a synonym for falsehood. Yeah. They say, well, that this is a myth. Just a myth. Mm -hmm. Which is a complete misunderstanding of the word. Because a myth is a story about the human condition and specifically how it relates to the divine. Mm. A fairy tale is a story about the human condition, but doesn't have the divine element. 
in it. Yeah. And it's so many of these themes overlap and come back. Storyline, telling stories, the myth that get handed down, all these things. And and, and so they are how the knowledge of human is is handed down. Right. Oral culture, when you you can't write books, you can't write anything down. The only way to teach your children any of your knowledge about humans is by telling them a story. Mm -hmm. Story is the same root word as storehouse, storage, mm. store room. Oh, yes. A story is where you where you store the in yeah <laughs> store your yeah. knowledge of human beings. I and love this. <laughs> it's I so um people will know that I'm kind of into Gene Keys world and all of the kind of ancient I Ching archetypes and stuff like that. And one of the big ones for me, one of the big archetypes is actually the 33rd hexagram, which is all about telling stories. It is all about wow. carrying on the lineage by um allowing the the heartbeat of the essence of the thing to be conveyed through the way we use the myth and the storyline and the archetypes within the story. So it I love it when people talk about it. Right, exactly. And it's, I feel like sometimes it's so interesting because we can get hung up on language and it is important the language that we use to say the thing that we mean, but also it's really important that whatever the language that is, it's backed up by the felt sense, the energy, the resonance yes. Yes. that gives the meaning and the sense. Let, let me put different language on that. Sure. To actually convey a thing, you have to manifest that in your body, in the moment that you are speaking it. Mm -hmm. mm. If you are saying, you know, and so-and-so was so angry or I was so angry, you have to let anger energy rise in your body, mm. not to the point of terrifying everybody, but you have to let there be some anger energy there yes. so that they get, it's a, it's a body to body transfer. Again, we go back to our bodies are much wiser and much more perceptive than our conscious minds. Mm. So what you put in the words is the part the conscious mind gets, but what you put in your body, what you radiate from your body mm. is the part that the other people's bodies receive. Mm. If you say, um, and we were all happy that they came back fine. So what I did was get a little sad there, a little, uh, right? So your body went like, what? Yeah. Because if we're really happy they came back fine, we'd, we'd be happy. We'd be What's happy. Up? Be a, yeah. Energy would be up, right? Yeah. Sadness flows down in the mm -hmm. body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a dripping downward wet quality yeah and so if you're telling a story about somebody and something and there's a sad moment you have to let it happen in your body mm. then the listener gets the experience that's an embodied transfer of knowledge mm. instead mm -hmm. of just a head you know like and this happened and you know mm. didn't even experience it but or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here up. And it, I've just spent the weekend just gone. I was at the Polyvagal Institute conference. Oh. Um, lots of dialogue about this word co-regulation. Right. And obviously it's, you know, polyvagal. So we're talking polyvagal theory. Lots of people are coming on my podcast and we'll talk about that in depth more with them. But that kind of sense of ventrally vaguely mediated social connection stuff. And it really became so obvious to me about this Um we are in relationship, which again, we'll come back to like personality patterns, but like, you know, we're in relationship to the nervous system of the person that we are speaking to. Yes. And if there is incongruence, maybe our brain can't quite get to the thing, but it's absolutely felt from the physiological world. But yes. also when we're talking therapeutics and in, as in how do we support individual if we're a healer or in the therapeutic realms, sometimes it's not what we do, it's how we be that is the thing that can support that shift to change because exactly. it's yeah exactly how we how we be our inner state of being um creates the 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 space the the possibility for certain things to happen mm -hmm. like one of the things i've discovered doing 40 years of therapy is that 
there has to be love in the space <laughs> and there has to be acceptance in the space for people to heal. Mm -hmm. And we used to know this as a society mm -hmm. to name all our hospitals, you know, St. Luke's Hospital, St. Jude's Hospital. Yeah. But, you know, the so-and-so nuns hospital, or you know, yes. there were religious organizations. The healing was taking place in the archetype of divinity and yeah. love. Yeah. And that's been changed, actually, during my lifetime mm -hmm. to those hospitals have been bought by um, corporations, mm -hmm. which use stock. And they have no connection to the divine, no connection to love, and they are about making a profit. Yes. And it's much harder to actually cause healing mm. to happen in the, in the, under that archetype. The mm -hmm. archetype of commerce, of making a profit, is not conducive to healing the spirit right. or healing the physical body. Mm. It can be terrific at mechanical work. Yes. You know, you can take your car to the garage. They can remove the, the broken carburetor and put on a better one. Yeah. Take your body to the hospital. They can remove the the hip joint that doesn't work and put in a, you know, a, um, a hip replacement mm -hmm. and your hip will work better. Yeah. But your spirit didn't heal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, are you sure you weren't in my meeting? Because we're building <laughs> medical and wellness centers. And we have this conversation regularly because we have investors. We have people who have yeah. skin in the game from a financial perspective. And we're also healers at heart. Like, this is a heart-centered business that I work in. And getting that balance where it's not about the deliverables. It's about the energy and the love that comes through the right. essence. Right. Not because we want to be nice people, but because that is the therapy. That's the start well, point for yes. the healing. Yes. Yeah. And safety, you know, and again, we come back to the kind of like, why did we create the personality balance or whatever? Because we felt unsafe, because we had something that we couldn't manage from an energy perspective. Right. So right. it stands to reason that the reset button is safety, enough felt sense of safety so that shift right. can occur. Um, from polyvagal theory you know that terrific uh, quote from Stephen Porges mm -hmm. if you want to make the world a better place start by making people feel safer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the essence of it right there right and that's Stephen Porges will be coming on the podcast at some point and we will dig into all of that and he you and it's interesting when we speak to the embodiment and the energetic thing because I think that's the thing I sensed when I was there um last weekend People like Stephen Porges embody safety. He's spent a lifetime studying it, but also being in it. And I'm sure if I was in a room with you, I feel very safe with you right now. I feel like when we had our first conversation, there's just this naturalness to the flow of things. And that happens when you have people who have spent time acclimatizing themselves to the safety within their own nervous system, I and, believe. And who are more present, yeah. which is another way of saying that their nervous system is regulated. Mm -hmm energy field is coherent yeah yeah i mean one of the things that is true about energy fields mm. is that a um a more coherent field or a, a stronger field will tend to cause a weaker field to become like it yes if the stronger field is coherent yeah the weaker field will also become coherent Mm -hmm. that's what a little kid is doing when they're upset they're dysregulated and they jump into mom's lap mm -hmm. they're counting on mom to be more coherent field more regulated yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it can be upset and gradually their system calms down their energy field becomes more coherent yeah the, it works the other way too if yes. you have a bigger stronger energy field which is chaotic mm -hmm it will cause a weaker energy field to also become chaotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I feel like this kind of 
it doesn't matter what lens you look at it. We can study the science of nervous systems and all that kind of stuff, and we can get really granular. I love that you're kind of in the energy body in in the world of this kind of um, more esoteric. And by that, I just mean you can't touch it necessarily. I don't mean woo woo yeah. or anything. Um, when how we do you science like that? I think we're confusing scientific method. Yeah, is a way of hypothesizing and experimenting to test the hypothesis. Right. We're confusing scientific method with uh, physical materialism, <laughs> which is a particular belief, a belief that the physical world is the world, the whole world, the first world, the last world, the only world. Don't even <laughs> look anywhere else. <laughs> there's no spiritual world, <laughs> yeah. mental body, there's no emotional body, it's just yeah. the whole body. So we're only looking in the physical body. So Stephen Porges and the polyvagal people are doing a terrific job yeah. of showing us where in the physical, physical body, system. nervous yeah. system, yes. these events, these, these yes. states yes. are originated. Yes. The part they're missing is there is a whole energy body that yes. actually creates the physical body and sustains the physical body. Mm -hmm. And what's going on in the energy body is determining what's happening in the physical body. I love that you went there because I think that's true too. And I I sit in some of these conferences and I'm like, this is great. Yeah. And <laughs> there's a there's an and bit. And there was a couple of times where I got really frustrated because I was like, you're being super reductionist like there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an and and i'm a functional medicine practitioner i you know i legitimize myself from the functional medicine biomechanics but also like metabolic pathways i could yeah. give you a lecture without even thinking about it on that sort of stuff but my blessing is that i came there after i'd done consciousness stuff contemplation spending time contemplating archetypes and being in the energy field and you know my mom started with donna eden energy medicine stuff okay, okay. like forever ago yeah. um and so that's where i began with like my mom doing health kinesiology and waving dowsing crystals or whatever it's just, okay. just like that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i started in in studying kinesiology and touch for health yes Back yes, in the 70s. back in the day. And that's, it's such a good, but it's great because Touch for Health, and for people who don't know, just Google it, but like Touch for Health is kind of mechanical. It's like a whole book of muscles, but actually it's very energetic because it's energy systems and there's like meridians in there and all sorts of things. And it's like, the. I mean, sometimes I think, why did we bother evolving? Because the, like the ancient Chinese had a lot of stuff right. <laughs> it's just, yeah, we've just added like detail that the human brain thought it needed, but we're kind of like coming back to the point that we were at, like like neural beds are chakra systems and <laughs> the whole thing is like, so yeah. Eventually we'll be able to integrate the the whole, the two understandings. Do you think? Uh, yes, I think, I think people are working on it now and it will gradually yeah. happen. It's bound to happen. Yeah. Maybe wow. not in my lifetime. I was gonna say life, that's the but, yeah. But eventually, mm. Mm. it's um. So, with these energy, with this energy work that you do, are you still using that in a clinical practice way? Are you researching it? What's your I, energy? I actually, I initially came into it through um, learning EFT, emotional freedom oh, yeah. mm -hmm. tapping process, tapping. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And um, so one of my questions in that was, of course, like, but how does it work? What Why am I doing? It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah like it's just like hitting myself. Yeah. I, could, I could see in myself and in my clients and the people I worked with that uh -huh. we were literally clearing trauma out of the body and it was not coming back. And then that problem no longer existed for that person. Mm -hmm. It's a specific problem, but it was gone now. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, the the best explanation that I got for mm -hmm. how it works was, okay, what we're doing it is uh, clearing frozen energy disruptions right. out of the energy body. Mm -hmm. Because the trauma is held in the energy body in these frozen disruption of energy flow. Mm -hmm. Trauma is not held in the memory. It's mm. not held in the emotional body. Mm -hmm. It's not held in the thinking body. Mm. 
which is why after a hundred years of talk therapy, talk therapy had not been able to figure out how to actually clear right. trauma out of the body. Yeah. I'm terrific at helping people adapt to it and accommodate it and work around it and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, dumpster fire is still happening there in the middle of your living room you yeah you're just really good at navigating around it <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and if we can actually clear the whole dumpster fire out yeah. and your living room becomes safe again mm -hmm. that's a totally different thing it's so I, I yeah have, that doorway into energy work as well as the classes in yeah. work with energy. Yeah. So. I, it's, I'm just, my brain is tying things together at the moment. I, I'm studying a lot of somatic, somatic experiencing and all that kind of stuff. And there's still a, a piece missing when we do some of that work for me, because it's, it's working uh -huh. very much with the body. Um, yes. And I still find myself thinking, and like there's an energy thing and maybe we can from the body move the energy from the somatic disorganization or you know being with the thing or doing the set about all of that yeah. stuff and I don't think you always need to I think if you've got an attuned energetic practitioner someone who works with frequency someone who can feel into the energy field mm -hmm. the, the thing is stored in the energy body not necessarily yeah. totally in the physical body exactly mm -hmm. I would propose that it's almost entirely stored in the energy body and if you can change the energy body, the physical body will follow rapidly. Yeah. And that's yes. the reason we get these reports of miracle healings. Yes. From various sources. I mean, certainly some of them happening with the tapping process. Yeah. But for decades, we've had reports of, you know, so-and-so did such and such and their, their cancer was healed, their... Um, uh, there, you know, the bones reset themselves yeah. or some something happened, which is not supposed to happen according to, to physical uh, laws. Yeah. Yeah. Allopathic medicine yeah. and um, physical science. Yeah. Because something was changed in the energy body and then the physical body simply followed suit because it, it is created by the energy body. And it, it has to be because we say we are consciousness in form, but we don't just go from consciousness to matter. Like there's a, there's a densification process. And so the yeah. energy bodies are the, right. the gradually increasing density right. of that state. And I, yeah, there's this, I, I think personally as, at the moment, I'm, I'm moving through this evolution of, I've been all the way into the wacky. I've been all the way down into the physical. I kind mm -hmm. of went back up to the, no, let's just coach people. We don't need to do functional medicine. And then somebody dragged me back down into medicine. And I think I'm personally getting to the stage of, I will probably be one of those people who has a part of all of the medicine will in my yes. toolkit. Yes, yes. So that we'll people have create the two worlds. Yes. And so the, the access points can be what people's appetite is there for, because we come back to safety. It's like if you don't have a lexicon of knowing energy work, and I suddenly come at you with, well, I think it's stored in your astral body, and I think we might <laughs> it's just not gonna translate. Whereas if I run a genetic pallet on you and get you into my office and convince you of certain things, there's a there's a different flow through it because you feel safer, I guess. Yeah. And I would propose convincing a person is not needed. <laughs> One of the things that I love about doing EFT on people is, you know, if the person says, well, you know, I don't believe in this, I can say to them, you don't have doesn't to. Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you were going in for um, gallbladder surgery because your gallbladder was inflamed and they needed to remove it, it wouldn't matter whether you believe that the scalpel will cut your flesh or not. It'll still cut your flesh. <laughs> and they will remove your gallbladder. And it uh, doesn't matter what you believe. Mm. Mm. And I mean, I, I love being able to say to people, you know, keep your belief. You don't, don't worry about it. We'll just see what actually happens in your body and in your experience during this session. As we British would say, the proof is in the pudding. Exactly. The proof is in the pudding. And in the eating of the pudding, in the yes. tasting of the pudding, it's in your personal experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so if people are interested in what you're doing, what what's your kind of main focus at the moment? Is it clinical practice or are you kind of working with people? Are you writing more books? I'm gradually retiring from clinical practice, so I'm not taking new people. Mm -hmm. um, I am I'm definitely doing consultations about the personality patterns, yep. that that whole map. Mm -hmm. But I'm not I'm not doing um, ongoing therapy. Mm or certainly not starting that. Mm, sure. uh, um, I intend to write several more books. Excellent. One is going to be on how to use understanding these personality patterns to have better relationships. Oh, I love everybody. that. Yay. Love yeah. that. Because obviously, I mean, if you can, you can think of the personality patterns as um, each, each pattern has its own mother tongue. <laughs> if you speak French and your sweetheart speaks German, right. If you only speak French to your sweetheart, they won't understand anything. And if they only yeah. speak German to you, you won't understand what they're saying. Yeah. It doesn't work very well. But if you can learn some German and understand their worldview and speak mm -hmm. to them in a in words that they can understand. Mm -hmm they will feel seen and heard and the two of you will uh, feel happier with each other. Yeah. And you can also discover how to behave towards a person to get the result you want. <laughs> In my work, I mean, my license is marriage and family therapist, right? right. A lot yeah. of work with couples. And working with couples using the... Um, the character structure map of personality, mm. one of the things that I discovered pretty rapidly was the couples who have a um, an unsolvable fight. Mm. They've been together 15 years. They've been having the same fights for 15 years. They're really tired of it, but nobody knows how to stop it. Mm. What I discovered was the problem is that their safety strategies cause the person who's doing the safety strategy to feel safer, but it causes the other person to feel less safe. Yeah. What person A does to feel safer mm. scares person B. Mm. Person B then do, does something that makes them feel safer, but it scares person A. Yeah. That is a loop they can never get out of. Right. Until they understand each other's personality structure yeah, yeah, yeah. and they can realize oh wait a minute it would be better if i didn't do that thing but instead do this thing mm -hmm. it will it will be safe enough for me and it will make them feel safer yeah then we can both relax back down <laughs> yeah. right yeah. instead of spiraling up into you know, yeah. fights that get pretty bad sometimes. Right, and repetitive, on-repeat fights Repetit that get... Oh, yes. I mean, people are exhausted by their fights, but they <laughs> stop it. Yeah, and it's so crazy because they're trying to get to a place of better and it always ends up, like, worse. So, mm. All of us have several basic um, false beliefs. Mm -hmm. One of them is that we see the whole world <laughs> that that our view of the world is the is the whole world mm -hmm. and another false belief is that our view of the world our experience of the world is accurate mm. in fact we're seeing only a small slice and that slice is distorted mm. and these unending fights are created when the two people have different slices that don't even overlap, don't mm -hmm. touch anywhere. Mm -hmm. So each one is doing what they honestly and sincerely believe is the wisest and best thing to do. Mm. But it's making the other person scared and crazy. Mm. I think the world needs your book pretty soon. <laughs> And maybe then write one for politicians on how to relate to the world and then maybe write one. <laughs> I also want to write one about attention itself. A wow. book on fostering your attention. My conviction is that 
being able to voluntarily control your attention, that is to put it where you want it to be and keep it there, mm -hmm. is the single most important skill any person can learn in their entire life. That's a that, statement. That single skill is foundational to every other skill. I really feel that. I really, I can, I can not only cognitively get what you're saying and, and kind of map it out in my conscious brain, but I, I you, there's, of course, because yes. Yes. what we highlight on is the thing that we're going to focus on and being able, it's what we were saying earlier. It's like, if I know I've got the remote and I know how to switch channel, I'm, the locus of like regulation yes. is within me. Exactly. Then what I see on TV is completely under my control. And I know it's under my control. Right. I don't think that just because I'm watching the horror channel and it's all horror movies, that that's really what's outside my front door. Yes. And almost it allows you to be with the horror movies more because you know at any moment you could change the channel. And so you can stay longer with the thing that's the stressful thing. To me, anyway. Oh, I personally can't imagine why you would want to. <laughs> well, no, but like if you're suddenly being forced to watch a horror movie to right. take this analogy beyond right. normal, right. but you can still right. do it because you know that, you know, I can sit with this because That's I've right. got remote and, and yes. that. You have a sense of control. Yeah. And that ability to be with. Right. It's how do we cultivate that? And if you can have um, ownership of your attention, you have that capacity to be with because you know you cannot be with because it's a choice. It, it becomes this kind yes. of like... You, can, you so, know yeah. you can move your attention away if you yeah. need to, yeah. which gives you um, more capacity to stay with something unpleasant. Mm. And again, this speaks to a little bit of like the somatic experiencing model of things where they feel like of, of like senses and the coupling of certain things and the undercoupling. So you pay more attention to the one certain thing. And some of the therapeutic tools is pointing the attention to the other bits so that you're kind of yes. switching channels on the perception of the felt sense or the sensation or the other thing. Right. And it's like, that's great as a therapeutic tool. Let me sit with you as a therapist, as a right. practitioner and help you attune to other channels. But the superpower of it is knowing the whole remote system and being able to tune to the different channels oneself. Yes. yes. And changing sensory channels is a really great way to work through any kind of trauma. Yeah. You know, just looking at the the, the visual with no sound. Mm -hmm. Yes. Taking away the visual and just listening to it. Taking away those two and just focusing on the smells. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's also a way to uncover buried parts of the trauma parts that are stuck in your body mm -hmm. but maybe aren't consciously apparent to you mm -hmm. one of the things that i learned to do in using eft with people to mm -hmm. really completely clear out a trauma mm -hmm. is to you know after we get the obvious parts to go looking for parts in different sensory channels mm. that's really interesting actually because i um i feel like sometimes we focus on the wrong thing um we're back to attention we always focus on highlight on the wrong thing and there is this there isn't the need to fully relive the experience but no. walking okay. through it with a with some of the stimulation not there so you're having a different sensory experience it isn't the same experience and i think people sometimes struggle right. to understand that the experience is one thing take away one of the senses it's not the same experience it's not you can't yeah. walk through yeah. that River yeah. without the thing so yeah and clearing something out of the energy body does not require that you re-traumatize yourself yes you you know it's like in order to put out the bonfire you only have to get close enough to it to start dumping water on it you don't have to stand in the bonfire and get burned again yeah you just have to get close enough to feel it dump some water go get some more water come back feel it but you know, gradually put it out. I think this podcast is going to win on our kind of series for like best analogies ever. We have stuck with themes, this podcast, which I love because we've talked about telling stories and we've consistently stuck to our stories and we've just expanded them and made them more applicable, which is awesome. I hope so. Yeah. You know, I, I love being able to um, 
to convey complicated concepts to people in a simple way so that they can really get it. Because that's really the only way we can get it. It, it has to come in in a form that we can relate to. Mm -hmm. That I, I, I watch one of my teachers do this continually. You know, someone in, in class says, well, I don't understand this concept. What are you talking about here? And the teacher thinks, okay, I know you work with horses. Here's here's the analogy with horses. For you, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I do this with my students all the time, actually. I've got like a quite a small cohort in my first founding year of the Unveil Academy. And there's like sort of around 10 of them come to each and every call. Yeah. Yeah. And I know enough about all of them to have that, you know, ability to make it right. make sense to them and, you know, right. have the contact points. Yeah. But it's the same stuff. It's the same. It's just same like, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. part of what makes you a good teacher. You can um, say it in the in the words and in the um, the sense memories that that person right. already has. Right. They yes. can take it in. Yeah. Yeah. And drawing the connections for them so that they can yeah. almost go on their own adventure with the the theory because it feels applicable. Right. They can get it in their body, and then their body can explore it can learn it mm -hmm. you know again if you only have it in your head you didn't really learn it yet <laughs> yes i'm now thinking of all the things that i've only got in my head that i really need to learn <laughs> well that's true for all of us but you know a lot of those it doesn't matter yeah true true that yes I really love this conversation. Is there anything else you want to talk about and bring up? I feel like my questions and shares have been more meandering than usual, but I'd love if there's anything else you want to talk to or speak about, I'd love it. There was one thing that we started and I sort of wandered off it. Mm -hmm. and that was the whole question of evolution of consciousness. Oh yeah, when, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere along the line in studying mythology and then fairy tales and archaeology, like yeah. reading, you know, the the um the books on the um digging up the the ancient cities yeah. of the near east yeah. uruk and um uh babylon and uh, well, newer there was one called now i've forgotten mm -hmm. um but you know these terrific archaeological records of um of unearthing and trying to understand mm -hmm. the whole history of human development. Mm -hmm. And I began to see certain patterns and began to understand certain developments in the, in the development of individual consciousness. Mm -hmm. That for instance, at first, the belief was, well, nobody has an afterlife, you know, you die and that's it. And um, and then gradually there, there began to be a person who was special, who had become the leader, the king, the high priest, the somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, they had this idea that they had an afterlife. So then when we buried them, we give them all this extra stuff. <laughs> you know, grave goods. <laughs> Right? Take it with you. Yes. Right. Now we'll build a whole pyramid to hold your body and the rest of us just get thrown into the shallow pit. That's no. Yes. And then gradually, you know, from 3000 BC, 5000 BC in ancient Egypt and, and in Asia up, up to into the Middle Ages in Europe, mm -hmm. this idea that um, that if an individual person could be important, not just a member of a family or a member of a tribe or a part of your army or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, in the Arthurian legends from 1100, 1200, 1300 mm -hmm. in Europe, we get the first, in, in European mythology, we get the first appearance of the archetype of the individual. The Holy mm -hmm. Grail myth. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, you know, that the after um, Arthur won all the battles and he became king and he had the round table and everything and all, he and all his knights are having a big party and everybody's happy and it's like, yeah, we won. We're, we're cool. We're in power now. All good. 
And then this witch comes in and the witch is always the figure that introduces something new into the stable, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. thing. This, this witch comes into the party and says, end of party. You all have to leave. You all have to go in search of the Holy Grail. You cannot go with anyone. You cannot follow any road or any path made by another person. Each of you must enter the forest alone at the darkest point. And you may not sleep in the same location two nights running. You must always sleep in a new place. You have to keep searching by yourself for this thing, the Holy Grail. It was the first um, appearance in our Western mythology of becoming an individual. Wow. That your job is to become yourself, not to become a good daughter or a good son or a good husband or a good mm. wife or mm. a good member of the community mm. or a good member of the church mm. or a good policeman or a good whatever your job is. Mm. Your task in life is to become yourself. Mm. We need you to be yourself. Mm. And um, and I've I've been fascinated by that. And my conclusion has been that psychotherapy is a is a radical endeavor because it supports the person becoming themselves, not becoming a better member of society. Mm. Mm -hmm. Freudian psychology was about, you know, we can't fix you. We can't help it. We're just going to help you. We're going to train you yeah. to be a better worker or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And typically that's the kind of psychology the insurance companies will pay for. We're going to right. Yeah. Get better fast right. <laughs> on this arbitrary scale of metrics. <laughs> yeah. But the psychology that people will pay their own money for is about becoming themselves. And at bay, at our in our hearts, that's what we all want to be. Mm -hmm. mm. You would fit right in here at Kuya. I'm sorry, Stephen. Like we might need to steal you because that's exactly what we talk about. And it's been my lifelong mission of finding myself. Like where, where, yeah. in, like hang on, I need to be connected to myself. And the only reason I've got here to being in this job is because I've done a lot of that work. And and we here are yeah. passionate about that very thing. It's not. There's no um, criteria that you need to meet other than finding you and being your soul and coming into contact with that and yeah. and just living from that place. And we were, we were speaking yesterday and there's a woman here who was part of our community kind of weaving and we have a, some, some similar characteristics of like empathy. And I said to her, but if I showed up like you did, it would be totally inauthentic. And yet we have the same. And it's just that living from self mm -hmm. And I love what you say about that uh, endeavor of the psychotherapeutic world, the, you know, certain elements of the psychotherapeutic world in this individuation idea. It's like all of the rites of passage that we kind of have lost in our society, but used to be present in tribal cultures weren't part, they weren't tribal, they were individual. Go into the wilderness on your own and good luck and hope you survive and then come back. And um, a lot of the tribal initiations were not designed to help you become an individual. Mm -hmm. They were designed to help you become a better member of whatever that tribe needed. So interesting. I, I specialized in working with men for some decades. Yeah. From the, the Robert Bly and Michael Mead um, conferences and the, the working with men and the whole question of male initiation. I got really deep into that one. Mm -hmm. And part of what I discovered was that we here in the West have this um, this romanticized image of tribal male initiation, that it's going to make you yourself. But in fact, it doesn't. I actually went to Africa mm -hmm. to uh, get an initiation, mm -hmm. which didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and part of what I discovered was that those the tribe, at least the one I was visiting, and from what I understand, it's it's the tribal way. Mm -hmm. The tribe doesn't want to make you yourself. 
They want to make you a better whatever the tribe needs. Right. If the tribe are farmers, they want you to be a good farmer. Yeah. If they're shepherds, they want you to be a good shepherd. If they're warriors, they want you to be a good warrior. Yeah. They're not so focused on you being yourself. Mm. That's the thing that we've come to. It's, it's a, a step farther. In the Western world, we've gone really far in terms of individuation, mm -hmm. far in some ways, mm -hmm. contact with the community. Yeah. But um, but it's it's a thing that that it, we've come to really desire here in the West, mm -hmm. and I think most um, most tribal, especially hunting gathering communities, they can't afford that. Mm -hmm. We're just scratching out survival right you know, on the land mm -hmm. we don't have the extra money and time to be becoming yourself yeah sure. it you is know? it is a luxury you know it having the time to think about exactly. it yeah and is it your assessment that this is where we're going is this the evolution of consciousness we are moving more into the individual i think, or? So. I think so yeah mm. but i mean ideally the collective first and then the emergence of the individual and then the individual and the collective both in balance. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because just the individual alone isn't good. It leads to lots of warfare. <laughs> yeah. Lots of narcissistic activity and all the things. So yeah. And I but this, and we're back at the theme that we've been speaking about, the kind of integration of yeah. things and yeah. yeah. I'm so, really glad to hear that your center and your group is doing such great work. I'm really jazzed about it yeah i i feel that there's a it's very easy in certain places especially in austin it's it's a bit of a it can be it can feel a bit like a wild west of therapeutic endeavor at times um and austin the, not houston right yes austin <laughs> not houston um, <laughs> and but the, the the thing that i love about here is the kind of the heart of this is community and mm -hmm. it's community to, to discover self it's community to, to discover identity yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. There's an African expression. I think it's Ubuntu. It is Ubuntu. I used to live in South Africa, yeah. so it's Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. I am because we are. We are. Mm -hmm. It's exactly that. And I, South when Africa. I was in South Africa, I was very much a part of this kind okay. of like, yeah, sense of trying to, yeah. So, and I, Excellent. I really love endeavors that are doing this. So we will have to invite you over at some point and you can come to our center. It's a beautiful place as well. Good. So Good. That would be lovely. Thank I did, you so much for spending time with me today, yeah, Stephen. You tell us many, many years ago, mm -hmm. but, you know, only briefly. Well, we'll have to get you out. We have plans for people to come out to Austin. We have, there's lots of thoughts about getting the good brains in a room and, and good minds on a topic of conversation. And I would love for, I would love nothing more than to have you as part of our kind of tribe of good minds, because I really love the way you think and the breadth at which you bridge like it let's make the concepts really simple and give it to in, people in language that they understand and energy work and evolution of consciousness i have loved having this breadth of conversation with you, Thank you. <laughs> it would be a privilege to to be there with you and yeah, yeah i mean it's exciting to think of like what uh, what we can all develop if we get more conscious together you know what could happen next for humanity Maybe we can figure out a way to make big decisions without having to have wars. Wouldn't that be good? I think good is an understatement. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. Um, yeah. Oh, such good work, Stephen. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. I have loved every second of this conversation. I feel like we could probably talk for hours more. There's so much in your brain that I'd love to unpack. Um, I will um direct everyone to where they need to be in the show notes and in the in the little outro that I'll record but thank you so much for your time your wisdom and your your service in this whole world of healing thank you it's a pleasure talking to you I've really enjoyed your breadth of knowledge and depth of knowledge and it's uh, there's much more spark in this kind of meeting than in most oh thank it's you lovely for me thank you <laughs> 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Unveil podcast. I hope that you found value in everything that Stephen shared. If you would like to check out the five personality patterns or the EFT therapy center, the links are in the show notes, as well as a link to purchase Stephen's book, both on Amazon and a potential chance to get a signed copy from his website of the five personality pattern. There is so much richness in all of this work. As you heard me say, I will be interviewing people such as Stephen Porges and Deb Dana and a whole host of other people that I met at the Polyvalent. Institute gathering and the Safe and Sound Summit last weekend and there's much more to come from the Unveiled podcast but as I alluded to there will be some changes afoot but for now all that's necessary is to say that if you found value in this episode please like subscribe or share with a friend who you feel might find this of value too and with that all that's left to say is thank you for listening to the Unveiled podcast and I will be with you again very soon